who gave us a phrase earlier today, a costly dump. Well done. I will be, I will be repurposing that phrase. Uh, I am Gil Alexander. Actually, what I'm going to be speaking about today is not what is, what is listed. Uh, we've gone a little late. A lot of people have done picks today, so I sort of wanted to do uh, a more general talk. Uh, but big shout to everybody who has spoken already today and yesterday. Mark Lawrence, uh, the SBR guys, earlier this morning. Uh, we had Ed Fang yesterday. We had uh, Gabriel Morency was here yesterday as well. Everybody who has done such a great job. Teddy Covers as well, of course, and of course, Clay Travis as well. So everybody give them a round of applause, I think. Uh, my name is Gil Alexander. I host a show uh, at the Vegas Stats and Information Network Monday through Friday. For those who don't know what the Vegas Stats and Information Network is, it is the first sports betting exclusive network on Sirius XM Radio. For those of you who remember Brent Musburger quote unquote retiring uh, during a college basketball game in Kentucky back in February, what he was really doing was retiring from ESPN to start along with his family this network. And it was really an honor to be asked to do the show before Brent's literally a job you can't say no to. And for many years before that, uh, many of you may know me from the Beating the Book podcast, which I've done for five or six years. And the real honor of all of that uh, is to say that in all those years, I've been uh, blessed to get to know real legends who started sports betting in Vegas, whether it was Chris Andrews uh, or Jimmy Vaccaro, Roxy Roxborough, guys who have, they started the game, Sorry about that. They started the game, and they really, um, you know, they're guys that are in their 60s and their 70s, and they are unbelievable resources who impart tremendous knowledge. And I think as we head into this football season, I just wanted to recount uh, one thing that Roxy Roxborough, Roxy Roxborough said to me about six months ago that has stuck with me, and I think uh, here after two days, I... I feel like I should impart on everybody. Roxy, for those who don't know, Roxy Roxburgh is a legendary Vegas figure who was the founder of the Las Vegas Sports Consultants. Uh, years after Bob Martin, Mark Lawrence talked about Bob Martin. Bob Martin was the gentleman who set the line in Vegas for so many years. All lines generated from one person, Bob Martin. Well, after that, Roxy did so at Las Vegas Sports Consultants. Roxy was a guy who was a pioneer in introducing predictive modeling into sports betting when he was a better, primarily with baseball totals, and then after his work uh, at Las Vegas Sports Consultants. And Roxy says to me at dinner six months ago, he says, Gil, no one beats the NFL. Nobody. And I want you to remember that. And so I know many of you might be saying to yourself, really two days and this last guy here comes up and tells us, you can't beat the NFL. Why didn't you tell us that day one? Well, let's think about that. Nobody beats the NFL. What does Roxy mean by that? Uh, so much of that comes down to humility and the recognition that what he's talking about makes some sense. Now, we'll get back around to what exactly he means and how you can actually uh, be profitable in the National Football League. But the humility that he's referring to is, has a lot of tentacles, one of which is is the, just the general notion that the NFL lines are the single most efficient lines in all of sports betting. As Matthew Holt, one of the speakers yesterday, told us, uh, they open the line, sharps bet into them at low limits, they get batted around all week, and by the end, you've got a closing line. And that is just, by definition, the hardest thing to beat. Many of us here in this room probably think of ourselves as sharp bettors. The definition of what a sharp better actually is, if I go 25-0 and 0 in my last 25 games and Mark Lawrence's lovely wife here goes 10-15 and 15 in those same 25 games, that does not mean, according to a bookmaker, by just that number, that I am a sharper better than she is. The definition of a sharp better is simply and only, as any bookmaker will tell you, the rate at which you beat the closing line consistently. And that, and that alone, is the best predictor of your future performance. And by definition, what Roxy is getting at is that because the NFL has the single most efficient lines, your ability to beat that over the long haul 
is lessened. Makes perfect sense. Now, he doesn't mean that you can't beat the NFL on a given Sunday. He doesn't mean that you can't beat it in any given month. Nor does he mean that you can't beat it in any given year. After all, uh, this past year's Super Contest winner was a Starbucks barista who won $900,000 playing the Super Contest. And by mathematical randomness, at this point there's so many entries in something like the Super Contest, that you're going to get a winner year after year that hits roughly 65 to 70 percent. We've even had winners now that hit over 70 percent. So you can beat the NFL in the short term, but you're battling a whole bunch of things. And one of that, in addition to not necessarily considering ourselves sharp betters, is to have the humility that we also, as sports betters, have a strain in us. Our brains are wired to want to, by definition, predict the outcome of future events. And you probably know friends of yours that are sports bettors, where that strain bleeds into other aspects of their life as well. They think they know everything about everything. We see it in the Twitterverse, where people think they know everything about everything. No one on Twitter has ever lost a bet, you may have noticed. So that's something that we have to combat against as well as sports bettors. The other thing is the humility of recognizing that our method of handicapping, your own method of handicapping, is not the only way to skin a cat. Mark Lawrence talked about fundamental and statistical and technical approaches to betting, not only the NFL, but anything. Well, I look at it as a spectrum as well, a different way of putting that. On the one hand, you have the most math-based handicappers in the world. And I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Bob, who is one of the pioneers of predictive modeling as well. No one is more black and white than Dr. Bob. I've seen it firsthand, no one works harder. On the complete other end of that spectrum are guys who kind of do it with smoke and mirrors. You don't know exactly how they're coming up with it. Sometimes they refer to it as situational. But the point of that is, is that oftentimes, and most times, the answer to the handicapping puzzle lies somewhere in the middle. And the humility to understand that your way may not necessarily be the best way is a huge key to approaching this as well. And by the way, within that, you also have to recognize that you've got to evolve. When I was handicapping baseball in 2010 or 2009, I was using Saber metrics probably well before most people were. And the ability to beat baseball just on simple fundamental saber metrics, from ERA to fielding independent and XFIP, was something successful with BABIP thrown in there. Today, you'll listen to any fantasy show in the world, and they're talking about swinging strike rates and handedness and weighted on base. So if I were to be stuck in that mode, I'm not beating baseball here as well. I've been in a room where even the most mathematical of handicappers argue with each other. Talked about some trends here, Mark did, in the last segment. Well, Dr. Bob was a guy who really relied on trends. I've been in a room with Rufus Peabody, recognized as one of the best sports bettors in the US, and Jeff Ma, slamming Dr. Bob for saying those things don't matter at all, period, trends never matter. They don't have the humility to recognize that at times, those actually do make sense. So all of that gets back to what Roxy says. You can't beat the NFL long term. And primarily, he's talking about all those personality strains and the fact that that market is so efficient that beyond a year, the longer you go, the less of a chance you are going to have to beat that. Now, let's park that for a second. And let's get to the legislation of sports betting. We'll come back to this where you can actually uh, beat the lines. We hear all about the potential uh, legislation coming down the pike. Some say October, maybe November. The Supreme Court is going to rule on pending legalization of sports betting in the United States. Now, there are two basic outcomes that people like to hypothesize. Those are the ones that are promulgated in the media. One, the status quo is upheld and everything remains as normal. PASPA is in effect, it remains as it is. The other possibility that people like to talk about is that PASPA is ruled unconstitutional and that New Jersey and every other state in the union can have at it, make your own markets in sports betting. Now that sounds great to some of us. Perhaps it will create creativity in the way that offshores have creativity in the markets they create, props, other things. Perhaps regional betting will change. There'll be more hockey bets, say, in the New York area. Some exciting prospects. But there's a third and fourth rail that no one really wants to talk about. And I know Clay Travis put it at 80% earlier. 
I want to try to steam the under on that a little right now, which is to say that the third rail of that, and this is not me bloviating, this is something that has been put forth in the Duke Review Law Journal, this is something that has been written in Supreme Court amicus briefs headed into this legislation by Ryan Rodenberg, and that is that once this goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court only takes 2% of the cases that are bought in front of them, so they have something to say about this. They have, by design, said to themselves, you know what, we have an opinion here. One of those opinions might very well be that, yes, they rule PASPA unconstitutional, but it's not that every state gets to have sports betting. At least on a temporary basis, no state, including Nevada, will be able to have sports betting. Not to say that that's going to be in perpetuity, but at least in a temporary basis. That is a very real possibility. The fourth is, and Roxy Roxborough says that this is also something that he thinks about, so again, not for me, what if, and again, when it goes to the Supreme Court, anything can happen. We think we have control over this, but once legislation hits that level, what if they say, you know what, sports betting for everybody except amateur betting. Amateurs can still be tempted by fixing no more betting on college athletics. These are real things that could happen. Now, the thing about that is that even with it, let's say it gets legalized tomorrow, let's say we, we come past those hurdles, the math has to work out. Vegas used to have a 10% tax on sports betting. Then it had a 2% tax. Today, none of us probably in this room, most of us are not aware that there's a quarter percent tax that exists in Nevada. And that low of a tax allows Nevada books to offer dime lines, to offer them in a way that they can be competitive with offshores. If they can't figure out the math, even if the legislation goes through tomorrow, then they will fail in achieving the very thing that they hope to achieve, and everyone the better, the savings, instead of being the savings in effect, quote unquote, will be passed on to the better, and the better will simply go and bet offshore instead anyway. So there's so many things that need to happen. First, get it past the third rail that I talked about earlier, no amateur athletics, or it's just ruled unconstitutional everywhere under the equal doctrine uh, statute, equal doctrine in this effect, ruining sports betting for everyone. But even then, if it goes, the math has to work out. So all of that comes, to, comes back to what Roxy was saying. You can't beat the NFL. Um, know this, that the origin of lines is where, and how lines are formed, is where we can find our edge still. So um, back in the day, it was Bob Martin. Then it was Roxy Roxborough at the Las Vegas Sports Consultants. Today, it's very fashionable to say that all lines get generated offshore. That's true of baseball. Bet Online uh, puts out the first baseball line. Bet Chris, Pinnacle, grab it. Vegas takes it on air. And it goes in that sort of flow. But in football, Vegas is not shy about starting lines. Uh, the Westgate puts out a line on Wednesdays, not before, not the Wednesday of that game, but the Wednesday prior to the next week's games, the look ahead line. It's a very useful tool to remember as the season progresses. Cantor puts out full season lines back in May. Um, Johnny Avello is the one who releases the first college football line at the win. By the way, beautiful, nice sports book right now at the win. Um, but I sit there every day at Visa in the Vegas Stats and Information Network, and I sit there with Chris Andrews and Jimmy Vaccaro, who are legends in the game, and they are not shy. They are the ones who put out college football season wins first. They put out games of the week before the season starts. They put out many props that others do not put out. No one is shy, and these are human beings. These are not algorithms. So the real advantage for us is not to try to beat the efficient lines of pregame lines for all of those games, but to look at the derivative markets that these human beings are trying to create. Andrew Garud was a gentleman who worked at Canner Gaming some five, six years ago. He was a British derivatives trader who came in and was the lead developer of the Midas algorithm. That Midas algorithm was supposed to be this amazing tool that you could not beat wagering in-game. Well, Andrew Garud, as, as uh, Matthew Holt will tell you, is no longer with us uh, in, this, in the United States. And the real advantages in football 
are in, as we've talked about in this conference before, small conference college football teams. There's over 100 D1 teams, smaller conferences, the bookmakers, the human beings now that, that you're pitted against are simply not going to be able to make good lines for those smaller conferences. In the NFL, second half lines, again, it's just a function of time. There's not a week for those lines to be calibrated and to be efficient. Those halftime lines are beatable because there simply is a finite amount of time to make them, and you as the better have the ability to beat the human beings making them. In-game wagering, we had chat rooms last year where we invited people from all over to try to talk and share thoughts on in-game wagering at all breaks during an NFL Sunday. And what we found, and this is probably no surprise to anybody, is that the discrepancy in the lines was vast, both in a juice situation and in the lines. That's where you will make your hay, doing that kind of wagering. It's humility, it's the recognition up front that you cannot beat NFL lines over the long term, that's the thing. Uh, and knowing that where the lines start, that's where it's very beatable. I'll tell you a, a little story, um, and just to give you an idea about the reactions of some of these, of, of some betters. Uh, back in the day, does anybody know about Crying Kenny? Anybody heard about Crying Kenny? Crying Kenny is a real guy. He was a better in Las Vegas many years ago. And Crying Kenny was the type of better who, uh, as his name suggests, didn't react well to when things didn't go his way. Crying Kenny was not an analytical guy. He did not think about the types of bet he was making in terms of, hmm, let me see what I did wrong there. Let me see how I can improve. Let me see why I'm not doing this. Crying Kenny had the uh, under in a Seattle Supersonics game many years ago. Um, and the um, score was about 0-0, zero, zero, exactly 0-0, zero, zero, I should say, about six minutes into the first quarter. And a player by the name of Downtown Freddie Brown, for those who are older who remember Downtown Freddie Brown, got absolutely hacked on a play six minutes into a scoreless ball game, put up a circus shot that fell to the bottom of the net. And Crying Kenny gets up in the sports book and screams, Jesus Christ, are they going to make every goddamn shot in this basketball game? Yeah, the under. It's two to nothing. So that's one thing with Crying Kenny. By the way, a better Crying Kenny story and the most famous Crying Kenny story of all time is that he had the under in a 1976 NBA championship game between the Boston Celtics and the Phoenix Suns, perhaps one of the most famous NBA championship games of all time. And Crying Kenny had the under, and the game went to overtime. Still a stone cold under. And then it went to the second overtime. And then it went to the third overtime. And that was the end of Crying Kenny's bet. And people looked over to see how Crying Kenny would react. And he was leaving the sports books, so people figured, oh, wow, Crying Kenny kind of handled this one okay. And three minutes later, Crying Kenny in 1976 came back into the sports book with a handgun and shot the screen in which he was watching the basketball game. No charges were filed, and Crying Kenny screamed, that's the last goddamn over on that screen. <laughs> True stories about Crying Kenny. That's how irrational sports bettors react. Crying Kenny did no self-examination. He figured he could beat that market every time. He didn't react to bad beats well. Uh, the difference with that Starbucks barista that I referred to earlier, who won the Super Contest last year, who won $950,000, if I'm not mistaken, just shy of a million in the Super Contest, he still works at that Starbucks at the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas, humble as could be, recognizing at no point did he ever say to himself, oh, it's all about me. I'm that good that I did this. He didn't suffer from confirmation bias. He didn't suffer from the DNA that most sports bettors, very rationally, I mean, makes sense, not rationally, but it's, it's logical that it follows that sports bettors who like to be right about the outcome of future events might think to themselves, yeah, get it going. we're back, there we go, might think to themselves they know a lot about everything in life in any other kind of subject. Uh, he didn't fall victim to that as well. Uh, and he recognized also along the way that maybe he was just blind fortunate for 17 straight weeks. Maybe he just got butt lucky the whole way. And there's a lesson in that. It gets back to Roxy's first statement, which is 
you cannot beat the NFL. So as you approach the NFL, think about those words. No one beats the NFL. Nobody. And if you come in with that approach and you think to yourself, okay, let me get the let me attack the markets that aren't as efficient. Let me get the ones that human beings like Chris Andrews and Jimmy Vaccaro or any bookmakers making on the drop of a dime going into a second half. Like these in-game wager numbers that are exploitable at every break of an NFL. You are so far better off in doing uh, it towards your approach to the NFL season. That is your task. It's probably the one, the best bit of wisdom I can give headed into an NFL season. And, and know that um, legalization is not around the corner. And so for this year, the status quo will remain on how you can get information to help you with your NFL season. Bit of breaking behind the scenes news. Um, I know of some networks, perhaps it's VEASAN, perhaps it's not, uh, who, who delve into the content of sports betting. And the NFL, now that this is going into the Supreme Court, the NFL has taken the position behind the scenes that because this has gone to the Supreme Court this year, they are not going to put their finger on the scale. They are not going to push at this point. Now, you can take them at their word, whatever their reasoning is, but that's legit. They're not going to change anything. So to, uh, this year on Football Sundays, you will not see any reference to lines on any type of pregame or postgame coverage. ESPN will not make reference to lines this year on Football Sundays. You will notice that their ESPN chalk coverage will diminish, and that is a conscious decision by the NFL influencing their partners saying, let's let this go another year. Let's see how it gets adjudicated in October or again, November, if you're to believe some people who believe it's going to be delayed. And no matter how it falls, we'll go from there. And so your task then also is, all right, I'm going to go to podcasts. I'm going to go to the Vegas Stats and Information Network. I'm going to go to these other places where I can get solid betting information. And getting back to that spectrum, again, um, it's one thing to know that Philip Rivers has a 136 rating when he throws to Hunter Henry, which could help you both in your bets and perhaps in fantasy as well. Uh, it's another thing to know that the Chicago Bears have the easiest schedule in football the first seven weeks of the season and the hardest the 11th week on. It's another thing to know that the Oakland Raiders last year had the worst point differential of any team that ever went 12-4. and four. Um, There's so many little nuggets that you could pick up the Philadelphia Eagles, one in six in one score games last year, playing the toughest schedule in football. And now Carson Wentz is a year older. And now there's Alshon Jeffrey and Torrey Smith and Lane Johnson, who was out 10, day, uh, 10 games last year, he, uh, key offensive lineman, is back in. Yes, you have to do your football homework. You have to be that much uh, more prepared than the next guy, certainly. But Really, it comes down to once you have that, it's that, it's the money management and the ability to discern where your edge is. Roxy's words, again, uh, you can't beat the NFL, but for a sliver of time, you might be able to beat the NFL. I hope there's something in that wisdom for everybody. We're running a little late today, so I wanted to keep it a little short. But that's essentially the story that I want to leave you with with Roxy. Um, I hope Cry and Kenny helps you as well.